Hi guys, so here's your overview of your first reading assignment in the class, which is part one of Everything's an Argument. Now this is just an overview. I'm not going to give you a lecture about everything in this, in this section of the book because it would be hours long. Um, there's a lot of information in this section of the book, and um, I want you to read it all thoroughly and take notes on it. Uh, what I'll do here is try to just give you an overview of what's there and introduce you to some of the concepts that I think might feel a little foreign to some of you so that you can um, kind of have a sense of what you're going to be reading about. And it might help if you read this section of the book before you listen to this lecture, and then if you reread it after, if you really want to get the most out of the class. Um, I know time is always a factor, but that's what I'd recommend if you've got the time. So this, uh, this section of the book begins by introducing just sort of the concept of arguments um, and what they mean in an academic context. I introduced this to you also in the first lecture for this class, in the introductory lecture, in the introductory, introductory lecture. It's a really hard word to say, evidently. Um, you might notice that sometimes my videos are a little bit rough and I'm not the best video maker. Uh, I'm a little bit awkward sometimes in person as well as over the internet, so pardon me if I say anything weird in these. Anyway, I did introduce argument to you in the, in the lecture, in the introductory module of the class, and I think I defined argument the way the book is defining it as just sort of a perspective on something, or also um, a perspective on something with evidence to support it. And that'll be consistent throughout the class. You can think of an argument in an academic context as a perspective on something, a point of view on something, or a claim. You could also use the term claim, which is just a term for a statement requiring support, um, plus evidence in support of that perspective or point of view or claim. So a simple example of this would be, I really like to do jigsaw puzzles. That's a claim. That's my perspective. That's my point of view. The reason I like to do jigsaw puzzles is that I find them fun, relaxing, and intellectually stimulating as well as harmless. So that's the evidence for why I like to do jigsaw puzzles. That's a really simple, kind of silly argument, but that would be an example of an argument because it's my perspective plus evidence in support of my perspective. Anyway, there are many types of arguments. The book introduces you in this um, section to just some basic types of arguments and um, what they are and what they're for. So um, there are arguments that rest on a claim of fact and an argument that rests on a claim of fact just makes an argument that something is the case, like global warming is happening or global warming isn't happening. Um, those are arguments that are based in fact because they're not really about opinions, they're about scientific data, but the interpretations of that scientific data can look different depending on who's doing the interpreting. And so for that reason, those arguments are arguments of fact, but there can still be differences. Um, you could see two arguments of fact about the same topic, and they're both arguments of fact, but they're both presenting different perspectives. Now, what makes an argument of fact different from just a regular old fact is that a regular old fact isn't really worth an argument. So a regular old fact like um, hummus contains tahini or something, that isn't really an argument. That's just a simple fact that you could kind of discern from looking at the label on a package of hummus in the store or looking up a recipe for it online. There isn't really an argument to be made there, it's just simply a fact. But an argument from fact is, an, is something that's a little more complicated than that. It has to do with interpreting data. So it's an argument that something is the case or was the case or will be the case in the future. Um, an argument from definition rests on a central claim that has to do with how a term or concept is to be defined. So um, an argument from definition might have something to do with, like if you're making an argument that we should define hate speech in a particular way. Um, you've heard it defined as such and such, but you want to define it in this more narrow way or this broader way or a way that has to do with impact on people or whatever. Um, if you're defining that term in an essay and it's worth a whole essay because it's a complicated term that has a complicated social um, background, political background, then it would be an argument from definition and not just simply a dictionary definition. An argument from evaluation rests on a central claim of value 
Um, and it makes an argument about the worth or value or meaning of something. So if you've had to write an essay before about literature, where you were sort of like analyzing a poem and giving your perspective on it, and then explaining why you have that perspective or why you take that meaning away from the poem, you are making an argument from evaluation. You are making an evaluative argument that rests on a central claim of value. Um, proposal arguments are the last type of argument that's introduced in this section of the book. Proposal arguments rest on a central claim of policy, um, making, an argument, making an argument about what ought to be done in response to a problem or situation, what action ought to be taken. And so an argument about how a particular traffic problem um, ought to be dealt with, that would be an argument from, that would be a proposal argument. So anyway, there's a lot more detail in your book about these types of arguments, but they're all introduced. By the way, when I'm using terms like claim of fact, claim of value, and claim of policy, I'm using two terms that come from um, Tolman style argumentation, which will be introduced to in the book. You can look that up if you want to. It's spelled T-O-U-L-M-I-N. Um, types of appeals are what's covered next in this section of the book, and um, you might have heard these terms before, logos, pathos, and ethos. These are terms that are Greek in origin, and so don't misread them as like pathos, meaning multiple pathos or something. Like I have one patho, I have ten pathos. Pathos is a word that's singular, and it refers to a quality. Similarly, ethos, logos, and kairos refer to qualities, not to like a pile of things. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of hard to explain, but just grammatically, I wanted to clear that up because I see confusion about that a lot. Anyway, um, pathos is an appeal to emotion. So an essay that contains pathos plays on a reader's emotions or appeals to a reader's emotions. Hopefully not in an unfair or tricky or weird way, but not to be like melodramatic or whatever, but just to sort of like get a reader emotionally involved. A really good piece of writing would contain pathos, ego, ethos, and logos, and would also take kairos into consideration. So when you appeal to a reader's emotion or get the reader interested in what you're writing about, um, you're using pathos. Ethos is an appeal to ethics, and so a writer will appeal to ethics sometimes by writing about something that involves ethics, but also by constructing his or her ethos as a writer. So when a writer tries to seem trustworthy and, um, well, trustworthy, I guess, and well-informed about a topic, that writer is appealing to ethos. Or appealing to ethics. When a writer cites work by other people and uses information credibly and has a bibliography that's very carefully crafted, um, that also plays on ethos. So when you are reading something and you feel emotionally invested in it, that's pathos. When you're reading something and you feel like the writer is ethical, the writer is presenting things fairly, the writer can be trusted not to lie to you or trick you or plagiarize or whatever, then um, that's ethos. Logos is an appeal to logic. So when you're reading something and it makes sense, what you're, what you're picking up on is logic, what you're picking up on is logos. So at, a, at the most basic level, the way that a writer can use logos in an essay is just by supporting all of the claims made. So you make a claim, you provide evidence for it. The essay works on a logical level. Um, kairos isn't really a quality that an essay has so much as an awareness of the rhetorical situation that the argument is produced in. So whenever a piece of writing or a text is produced, it's usually coming out of, a, it's almost always, I guess, always, I hesitate to say always, but I think always, it's always produced in and for a particular situation. So the classic example that comes to mind is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. So this was a speech that was produced and given during a very particular time period in our nation's history in response to a very specific context. And um, it was given by a specific person toward a very specific audience. And so all of that stuff comprises the kairos, the rhetorical situation of that speech. So this is just something good to keep in mind as you're writing, whenever you're writing or making an argument, um, think about who you are, think about what you want to say, and think about who you want to reach. Um, and if you're doing that, you're keeping the rhetorical situation in mind. Um, your writing will always be better if you kind of think about who your reader is and how you can reach that reader. So fallacies of argument are covered next in this section of the book. Um, fallacies of argument you may have heard referred to before as logical fallacies. Your book kind of makes more specific designations of fallacies, so fallacies of pathos, fallacies of ethos, and fallacies of logos, which would be, properly speaking, logical fallacies. 
But basically, all of these fallacies are things to avoid. They're ways that an argument can go wrong. So fallacies of pathos are ways that pathos can get screwed up. Um, eth fallacies of ethos are ways that uh, ethos can get screwed up. Fallacies of logos are ways that logic can get screwed up. And the book lists a whole bunch of these, more than I even want to go into. There are, uh, there's a whole big list of um, emotional fallacies, ethical fallacies, and logical fallacies. You don't have to memorize all of these. But I'd like you to look at them, try to understand them, and try to avoid them in your own writing. And also, the benefit to understanding these is that when you're reading an argument in this class or when you hear an argument elsewhere in the world or read an argument elsewhere in the world, if you disagree with it and you're familiar with these fallacies, it'll give you a vocabulary for why you disagree with it, maybe. So if you find something illogical, you can explain why you find it Ill illogical, maybe using the fallacies of Logos, for instance. So anyway, um, rhetorical analysis is the last thing that's covered in this section. Um, and there's a whole bunch of information about how to do a rhetorical analysis, which is good because your first essay in the class will be a rhetorical analysis, which you know if you've read ahead a little bit in the syllabus. Um, so basically speaking, a rhetorical analysis is an analysis of someone's argument to determine how well it works. So what you do is you look at what, what choices the person is making rhetorically, um, what choices they've made as a writer, their use of pathos, their use of logos, their use of ethos, their use of information, um, and try to figure out whether you think it's persuasive or not, whether you think it's well written or not, and if not, why? Um, and if it is, why? So that's what a rhetorical analysis is very, in a very simple way. Um, the questions on page 89 are a really good guide, uh, and a really good introductory guide to doing rhetorical analysis. There's also a way more detailed guide that appears on page 112 to 117, the very end of this section. It's in yellow. The pages are like a butter yellow color kind of. So check those guides out. Those will help you, um, those will help walk you through the process of doing a rhetorical analysis. We'll use those in our first essay in the class. Um, specifics about analyzing arguments based on logos, pathos, and ethos are also contained in this section of the book, and that's useful after you've already kind of digested the information about logos, pathos, and ethos. And then also, lastly, on page 106 to 111, there is um, an essay written by David Brooks of the New York Times, and then after his argument, there's a rhetorical analysis of his argument by um, I believe it's a student, or she's supposed to be a student anyway. So you can kind of see an argument and then somebody responding to that argument in the way that you'll be doing in the class. So I hope you find that helpful. So this first section of the book, there's a lot of stuff in it. It's really foundational stuff for the class, so I hope you're able to understand it. I hope you're able to remember it. Um, if you have questions about any of this stuff, you can put those in the discussion forum for this week if you think other students in the class might be able to answer your questions. If you have questions that you don't think students would be able to answer or that you want to just ask me directly, you're more than welcome to do that. You can send me a message and I'll try to respond promptly.